everyone, I'm Barbara Ham Lee. When you think of the word philanthropist, what image comes to mind? A well-established blue blood family with deep ties to the community? An older white gentleman or lady with deep pockets? What about an African-American with a giving heart and some dollars to share? Can he or she be considered a philanthropist too? Up next on Another View, the phenomenon of giving and the true meaning of philanthropy. Plus, out of the mouths of babes, wait till you hear from 11-year-old Bryson Dildy. And while one millennial says she will be silent no more. Lots to cover on today's Another View. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Discussing today's topics from an African-American perspective, this is Another View. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Another View. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. We have a lot to cover on today's show, including a conversation about African-American philanthropy with my guests Vivian Oden and Brittany Deutsch, founding members of a new African-American giving initiative. But we start with a very special thank you to the more than 150 people who joined us last Friday as part of our live audience at Fort Monroe. It was the kickoff to a weekend full of activities commemorating the 400th anniversary of the first Africans to land in English North America. And Lisa Godley, Todd Washburn, and I are so grateful for your support. We were amazed at the number of you who came out and sat under the magnolia tree (laughs) while we watched the show. It was great. Now, on Saturday, the commemoration continued with lots of speeches from dignitaries from around the world. But one young man and stole the show. His name is Bryson Dildy. He's 11 years old and a student at Larkspur Middle School in Virginia Beach. And he's such a little guy that they brought out a, a step stool so he could stand on it while he was delivering his speech. But his speech was so moving that we decided to bring it to you in its entirety. Let's take a listen. My name is Bryson Dildy. And today I am honored and delighted to be a youthful voice to help celebrate this occasion. When the first Africans landed here at Fort Monroe 400 years ago, they may not have known how their sacrifices and contributions would help shape our community and nation. As the years and generations pass, there are also local African Americans who continue to give contributions to society, such as Katherine Johnson, a resident of Hampton, a mathematician who is known for calculating trajectories for many of NASA's crewed missions. We should also recognize Mary Jackson, who in 1958 became NASA's first black female engineer, and who was born and educated right here in Hampton, Virginia. I am sure the first Africans would be proud of their accomplishments. However, there is another way that we can all give back to our community. We could simply start with how we treat one another. Are you kind to others daily? I'm not just talking about being kind to friends and family. How about being kind to people you barely know or do not know I want to share a personal story. Earlier this year, my teacher was battling cancer, so I wanted to do something to let her know she wasn't on this journey alone. With the help of others, I collected 551 cards to encourage her and brighten her most difficult days ahead. We can all find ways to show kindness to one another. For example, hold the door open for someone walking behind you or walk around with 
a smile on your face. Your smile may brighten up someone else's day. Be helpful to the elderly and disabled. Pray for our country and others during times of tragedy. Create ways to volunteer and help others. Why do all of this, you may ask? Well, in my 11 years of being on this earth, I realized that Maya Angelou's quote is true. She said, people may not remember what you say or do, but they never forget how you make them feel. Imagine the problems that would be solved if all people were kind and feel cared for. It doesn't matter what your race or religion may be, we all deserve kindness. And we all should show kindness. And as we commemorate 400 years of the first Africans landing here at Fort Monroe, let's make them proud. This is more than just a speech. I challenge you to let today also be a celebration of your commitment to become a more caring and kind individual to all. Thank you, and God bless you all. <laughs> In my 11 years on this earth, <laughs> <laughs> what an incredible young man. And so the celebration, the commemoration, it was an incredibly moving weekend. And thanks to everyone who came out to find out more. And if you want to know more about Fort Monroe, um, on our sister station, WHRO TV 15, on Thursday, September the 5th, from 10 until 1030, they're airing The Future of America's Past, Freedom's Fortress. And it is all about Fort Monroe. Uh, the remarkable place where slavery began in British North America and the site where it will begin to unravel during the Civil War. So that's on Thursday, September the 5th on WHRO TV 15. So giving is another way to show kindness, and it happens in so many ways in the African-American community. We tithe, we serve the homeless, we take in relatives when things go awry, we give to our favorite charities. But ask the average African-American if he or she is a philanthropist, and the answer will more than likely be no. So why don't we consider ourselves philanthropists, and how is our community doing on the giving scale? August is African American Philanthropy Month, and here to talk about Black giving is Vivian Oden, Vice President for Special Projects with the Hampton Roads Community Foundation. Hey, Vivian. Hi, Barbara. How Hi. are you? I'm good. How are you? Yeah. Welcome back. Thank you. <laughs> we appreciate it. And Brittany Deutsch, she's a certified public accountant and the CFO for Hampton Public Schools and uh, and the founding member of the Visionaries for Change African American Giving Circle. How you doing, Brittany? I'm doing great. Great. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. So, Vivian, let's define philanthropy because in the black community, a lot of people don't think of themselves as philanthropists. They don't. I mean, when you think about philanthropy, you think about a Bill Gates or a Warren Buffett or someone with a lot of money. Even in the black community, you look at LeBron James, who he did a lot for the Promise School in Akron, Ohio. So you're mm -hmm. like, OK, he has the money he's giving. Or Steph Curry recently um, mm -hmm. supporting Howard University with their golf program or Oprah Winfrey. So mm -hmm. you look at these people and you're like, OK, they're philanthropists. They have a lot of money. But when they look at themselves, they're like, I just give money. I just want to give back to my community. I don't see myself as a philanthropist, but you are. Mm -hmm. You're a philanthropist, whether you're giving your time, if you're going and you're volunteering, um, feeding the homeless, like you mentioned, mm -hmm. you're a philanthropist. If you're giving your resources to a particular organization, you're sorority of 
fraternity, your church, you're a philanthropist. But many times we don't think about that because it's like that's what we're supposed to do. We're mm-hmm. supposed to give. And so we don't look at those big terms like philanthropy as a way of as giving. A way, a way of right. doing that. Right. So, Brittany, what, was giving something that you grew up with that you thought about um, as, as a founder mem- mem- member of Visionaries for Change? And we'll talk about exactly what that is. Um, that's a big commitment that you've made to the community. Yes. You know, growing up, you know, giving was just a part of what I saw in my family. You know, I am a a Christian, so going to church and, you know, knowing that that's an aspect of, you know, being a Christian and giving back to your church for, you know, helping other people and helping the community around the church. And, Mm -hmm. you know, like Vivian said, example of, you know, or taking in, you know, family members, you know, those things I saw growing up, but I never put a formal term of philanthropy to it. Mm -hmm. That's just what we do. That's just what I saw. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as I'm growing up and getting older then I have that same responsibility to do what I saw so you know giving now I know I'm a philanthropist <laughs> hey I can say that now <laughs> I know that's right <laughs> with a big smile on yeah, your face absolutely you know, so. <laughs> well Vivian let's talk about what is visionary for change okay what so- is that about Right. So I'm going to go back to last year. Okay. So last year, Valeda Footwood, who was on your show Mm -hmm. as well. um, So doing research and realizing that people need to be aware. uh, No, many times people don't know August is Black Philanthropy Month. Mm -hmm. They didn't know that. So it was really about educating people in the community about black philanthropy, about philanthropy in general, about the power of endowments and long term giving. So bringing in Valeda last year, doing the solar philanthropy exhibit, Mm -hmm. having the opening night um, reception to the exhibit. Valeda started talking about this idea of a giving circle of people giving collectively coming together to give Mm -hmm. and people heard that people that came and heard her um, even when she joined you on your show last year she talked about about the giving circle Mm -hmm. idea she's a part of a giving circle a black giving circle in Charlotte and so people came to me I had conversations with black civic and community leaders coming to me saying what is this idea of a giving circle? This sounds very powerful. It sounds powerful that people are able to come together, give collectively, set up an endowment fund. Many times we give to organizations and yes, many organizations have immediate need, but the concept of an endowment, something that will grow grow and that can last forever. mm -hmm. Correct. Mm -hmm. So visionaries for change kind of sparked out of that, uh, out of last year, black philanthropy month. And so civic leaders in the black community, community leaders came together pool their funds collectively mm-hmm. to create an endowment fund and then able to now make decisions, be at the table to make decisions about issues that impact our community. And that's where Visionaries for Change kind of came out of mm-hmm. that forming of a black giving circle of people making decisions about grant making. But giving circles themselves are not new, but it's new to the African-American community in, in terms of, of giving. So why, why would that disconnect do you think? Because I've heard of giving circles before, but not necessarily focused on our community. Right. Well, it's something that's growing up throughout the United States. So it's growing up in Birmingham, Alabama, like this year's Black Philanthropy Month celebration speaker, Marsha Morgan, Mm -hmm. they have a Black Giving Circle in Birmingham, Alabama. So it's growing up. I think it's a new concept maybe to Hampton Roads Mm -hmm. and something that hasn't really been talked about in the Black community in Hampton Roads. So when people heard about that, that was a new concept for them. Not new for overall. Yeah. It's new maybe for this community. Okay. Okay. So, um, Brittany, you were approached, I assume, uh, to talk about the, the visionaries for giving, uh, for change and so forth. What made you decide? Because you came in at the leadership circle level, yes. which is a significant amount of money over the next three years. Um, so what was your thought process in terms of, OK, A, I want to give and B, how much I'm going to give? So I actually heard about the Given Circle through a lunch with a friend, Sharice Newsom. And we were actually just talking about I think this was around the time that the um, billionaire investor um pledge to pay off the student loan debt for Uh, the graduating class in Morehouse. Mm -hmm. So we were talking about that. And then we just started talking about giving. And 
as Sharice was telling me about the giving circle and, you know, the work that Vivian um, done, I said, I want to be a part of that because I think it's important for us to not just always be consumers. You know, we should be helping other people and, you know, helping to meet needs. So when she said, you know, there's this mechanism where we can pull our resources, you know, I have funds, some discretionary funds that I can use to help other people. So let me be a part of this because I think that's what life is generally all about. Mm -hmm. One thing, Vivian, you have a lot of younger people yes. like in their 20s and 30s yes. that are giving and they're giving at the leadership circle level um which is is really significant is yes. it not <laughs> yes it is um and it's giving them a different avenue more practical something that they're familiar with um at that level but being able to make those decisions at the leadership level and really shape what this giving circle is all about so yes that um it's important to have a diversity with age to come in to bring different perspectives to um, the grant making decision so the, take it to that next step so they're going to make um well, the money comes together you set up the endowment how does it get back to the community? So what happens is they set up an endowment. In order to set up a um, majority of endowment funds at the Hampton Roads Community Foundation, you need a minimum of $25,000. Okay. So we've met that minimum, but we're continuing to give for that three-year commitment so the endowment can grow. And the more it grows, the more money you're able to get back out into the community. Mm -hmm. So there is a percentage that comes off of that endowment fund that then goes back out into the community. So the Giving Circle will come together, decide what their focus area. So the focus is on charitable organizations in the black community, mm -hmm. but are we going to focus on education? Are we going to focus on healthcare? So those are decisions that the Giving Circle members will decide. And then once that's decided, then we will look at what organizations within those communities or within the black community mm -hmm. around health or education, we would then decide to fund I as see. a collective group. So you're at the table making decisions about where the funding is going. And is, is it something where people will apply or, or will you all just say, okay, we know about X group and we want to give our money there? It could be, be both. both ways. It could be both ways. Mm -hmm. So we could solicit proposals or it could be, well, we heard about a cause and collectively we agree we want to support that particular cause. So it can be either way. Mm -hmm. What do you say, Brittany, to... Um, others in your age group and, and, and folks that you work with professionally about giving. Do you guys ever have conversations about being philanthropists and, and why it's important? I don't think we've had conversations around being a philanthropist. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's just been more around, you know, you know, there's this organization that's doing something with a local nonprofit. Oh, I'm volunteering my time here. Or, you know, I'm going to hold a function where in a certain amount of the proceeds are going to go to benefit this nonprofit. I think it's just been general conversations based on things that are near and dear to our hearts mm -hmm. um, more than, you know, the formal aspect of giving. 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. We're talking about African-American philanthropy. Are you a philanthropist? Have you given, are you a new member of the Visionaries for Change Giving Circle? We'd love to hear from you and hear your story. 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. So Vivian, you know, I had the pleasure of working with the Hampton Roads Community Foundation um, through my company. Um, in terms of doing a focus group on African-American giving. And not a lot of people in the black community know about investing through foundations, through community foundations. Can you talk a little bit about what the purpose of the community foundation is and, and why that's a, a kind of a new way that people are placing their dollars? Right. So with the Hampton Roads Community Foundation, it's all about long term endowment funds, growing endowment. So I'll give an example. So many times nonprofits, let's say a nonprofit is raising money for a scholarship and each year they're raising that money to send a student to college and then they raise the money. They send that student to college. They go on and they're doing this every year. And then one year, let's say if they have a building that starts leaking or if they have a, another unexpected emergency that comes up. And now they're like, OK, we don't have the funds to be able to support that emergency need. So now they're deciding 
do we continue to raise money for that scholarship or do we support that emergency need? And that's a conversation that that particular nonprofit has to have. But if you have an endowment fund, you can have that endowment fund say, hey, let's support that scholarship every year through this endowment fund. So when unexpected issues come up, you can do your fundraising for that unexpected issue. And then you don't have to decide on a child's education each year Mm -hmm. or that year when that unexpected Mm -hmm. emergency comes up. Mm -hmm. So the endowment is so important because it's something that will sustain your organization for the long term, long haul. And just getting organizations to think about that. I've been involved in nonprofits that had to close because they did not have an endowment fund or they lost their funding from other Mm -hmm. or funding was cut. So those are things that you have to think about. If you want to be able to support the services that you're doing in the community for the long term, then you need to look at other ways to generate funding that you're not having to raise every year. So individuals can also have funds. Correct. 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 Okay. Um, and is is that twenty five thousand dollar threshold for them also if if they want to invest their their dollars? Yeah. So to start a fund at the foundation, minimum is twenty five thousand. So whether it's a scholarship fund or a donor advice fund, where they have the opportunity to to advise throughout their lifetime or a designated fund where they can just designate the organizations and that organization gets a check every year or a field of interest fund or unrestricted fund. Yes, they can set up an endowment for $25,000 that will continue. That is a name fund for their name or in memory of any someone that they want to um, support contribute to or um, remember, they can continue to do that every year. So yes, individuals, even organizations can set up an organization endowment fund for their organization where that money comes every year. So if you get pushback, and this is to both of you, Mm -hmm. um, from people who say, you know what, I'm not giving my money that way. I, you know, why, why should I do that? I work hard every day. What's, what's the point? What would you say to them, Brittany? I would say that, you know, yes, we're talking about the money aspect, but you can give your time and that doesn't cost anything. So what's great about, you know, being a philanthropist that is your volunteering as well. Mm -hmm. So if, you know, we're all not at the same place and, you know, the economy is what it is at times. So I can understand someone having that valid concern, but if you can take an hour, you know, even an hour out of your week, to mm-hmm. go tutor, you know, a young person or, you know, to mentor a young person or to help with a food bank or a homeless shelter. That counts and that means something. What does it do for you? Uh, what does it do for me? <laughs> I think it just makes me just realize that I'm doing something good and that it's going to inspire someone or encourage someone. Mm -hmm. Because I think we need that. Mm -hmm. We need that. And what does it, what do you say? What's your pushback? Yeah, no, I, yeah, I agree with Brittany (laughs) um, about being able to be a philanthropist in a different way. Many times people equate philanthropy to resources to money but as Brittany was saying you can give your time you can adopt a school I'm back to school school is starting next week yeah. so yeah. you can donate school supplies yeah. to an organization that's a way for you to give back giving your time you can also look at collective giving like visionaries for change <laughs> you can um you might not have that twenty five thousand dollars but you're wanting to come together with like-minded people to be able to give your resources and give mm-hmm. give your time is a great way. So the the leadership circle is $5,000 for three years mm-hmm. with a three-year commitment, 5000 each year. Correct. correct? Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, if you don't have $5,000, can you still join Visionaries for Change? So there's other two levels. Um, okay. There's a $1,000 level at an individual. So if you want to be a founding member, you can give that $1,000 a year for each year for three years. Mm-hmm. Or as a couple, if you're not coming in at the leadership level, you can do $1,500 a year for three years at the leadership, at the um, couple level. Couple That's level. not mm-hmm. at the leadership level. But so right now we're through the recruitment phase for founding members through November 1st. But after that time, you might not be able to commit for those three years, but you still want to support and be a part for maybe a year so you're you're able to still come in and and support the cause and support visionaries for change maybe Mm -hmm. not at a as a founding member but just as a member for Mm -hmm. maybe a one-year commitment and is there is there any limit to how many people can can join or or you'll take all the dollars we'll, you can get, no, right? There's no, <laughs> <laughs> there's no limit. 
uh, 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240 are the numbers to call if you're just joining us. We're talking about African-American philanthropy and with Vivian Oden, Vice President of Special Projects with the Hampton Roads Community Foundation and Brittany Deutsch, CPA and founding member of the Visionaries for Change African-American Giving Circle. Let's talk to Mustafa Jeffrey from Hampton. How are you? Yes, good day to you. Good day to you. I, 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 uh, I don't consider myself a philanthropist. I am a Muslim, but I, I, I give to 41 girls and 21 boys every year for school. I provide everything for them. And there are what we call the, the um, we call ourselves African Americans. They call themselves Negros, Filipinos, in the country of the Philippines. Okay. They're the most poorest people in the country of the Philippines. Uh huh. And so, I provide their complete education for them. So why don't you consider yourself a philanthropist? Because as a Muslim, it's a part of my environment to do. Ah, I see. Okay, thank you so much for calling, Mustafa Jeffrey. We appreciate that. So culturally. There, there may be a difference in, in terminology, although we're all still doing the same thing. Correct. That is correct. And I think it's really important to understand giving in different communities. Um, that was one thing that, um, along with understanding black giving, but looking at giving in maybe the Filipino community or mm-hmm. the Hispanic community and understand the way that they give. So I think that's important to recognize that in different communities, they give differently and things are more important to them than other causes, but they're still philanthropists and they're still giving back. So what, so let's talk about the the characteristics of black giving. What makes us different from other groups in terms of the way that we give? With um, black philanthropy, we tend to many times give to our church. Um, That is something that's huge in the black community. Mm -hmm. Um, We tend to give to our fraternities, sororities, that's something different. Um, But Kellogg did a study um, a few years ago about black giving and how we're giving back in the community. And that actually African Americans um, give 25% more of their income annually to causes than um, white households. Um, Mm -hmm. And that's like $11 billion each year. So we are giving, we might not consider ourselves philanthropists, but we are giving a lot of money each year to things that we really care about. And we're, we tend to give to immediate needs. You know, we don't tend to think about endowment funds. Cause like, look, that student has to go to school or that student needs a backpack. So, right. so that we need that right now. We need it right, right. now. Mm-hmm. Um, but trying to get people to think about, you want to be able to give more backpacks or support more students. So if you think about it in a strategic way, in a long-term way, mm-hmm. then you're able to make a big difference. Not saying that you're not making a difference now, because you are, but looking at making a difference in it, um, another way. You know, it's interesting because, and and having worked for a nonprofit here at WHRO and, and other organizations, um, particularly among the development community, uh, in general, there at one time was a real um, mindset that black people didn't have money to give. And so therefore it was not worth the time to go talk to them or to go cultivate them. There seems to be a shift. Where is the shift coming from? I think I mean, I think about talking to people around visionaries for change. And so it's this thing where people say you have not because you ask not. And many times you're not asking. People will say, or I've heard someone say to me, Vivian, no one asked me. Yeah, I have money. I could have given, but you didn't ask me, so I'm not going to give to you. Mm -hmm. So I think um, the shift is happening because people see that black giving is huge and it's happening. Um, But you need to be able to ask people and cultivate those relationships you can't just go the first time and ask them and think, hey, you know, I'm getting my money. <laughs> and they're like, who are you? <laughs> so it's really important to start building and cultivate those relationships. Right. And then maybe they will see the importance to your cause or your organizations to um, back whatever you're doing. Brittany, I noticed you were shaking your head when she was talking about the fact that no one asks. Yes. What, is that, yeah. Has that been your experience? Yeah, I, I think that is, you know, if I don't know about something, 
then I don't know that I can give to it. So if you tell me about something and I said, oh, you know, I would like to support that, then I will. Mm -hmm. But again, you have to ask, you know, you have to broaden that net. Yeah, and I think that cultivation piece is a very important piece. I mean, I've heard that from from um, uh, people who have money to give and want to give to groups, but they want to be made be made to feel special, mm -hmm. also. Mm -hmm. You know, right. just like any other person that would be cultivated and and because um, there's just certain people, like you said, you just wouldn't just walk up to them and say, <laughs> "Can I have yeah. a million dollars?" <laughs> right, right, right. No. And think about how many people didn't know August was Black Philanthropy Month. Yeah. And mm -hmm. Black Philanthropy Month has been around since 2011. Right. So just what is all about education mm -hmm. and building those relationships and letting people know what's out there and what's going on in the black community. Mm -hmm. Well, and I, the other piece of this, too, is that there seem to be more people of color involved in actual development now. You know, Vivian, yes. you're now vice president. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but but very seriously, I mean, the Hampton Roads Community Foundation is making a major shift in terms of not only the the um, giving circles and things of that nature, but even your programming going forward as we're talking about beneath the surface, mm -hmm. as we're looking at race relations and um, and things of that nature. So. There, there seems to be a, a reckoning, reckoning that there's a greater community out there that maybe hasn't been tapped before and there's a resource that needs to be engaged. Yes, exactly. Um, the foundation is committed to our diversity, equity, and inclusion work and seeing that importance within the work that we're doing in the community, but also internally. So yes, Beneath the Surface, um, a project that you mentioned that mm -hmm. we're looking forward to continue conversations in the community around race as a piggyback to the um, Dr. Tatum, Beverly Tatum coming yes. back in May mm -hmm. to the Chesapeake Conference Center. And when Center. we did the uh, conversation about the school in Chicago. Right, yes. America exactly. to Me at Norfolk America State. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, so it's important to look at race, racial equity in different ways, whether it's through philanthropy, or whether it's through building those relationships and having those conversations, mm -hmm. building trust. I think trust is really important. So when you're thinking about cultivating, cultivating those relationships, it's about building that trust. So you have to have conversations. Yeah. And so that's kind of looking at that and, and going to looking at racial equity in different ways. So, Brittany, are you are you cultivating other friends? Um, what are you telling people about Visionaries for Change? What do you want to see? So I haven't I haven't talked to a lot of people yet, <laughs> um, but that is my goal is to really, you know, once we kind of have more information on how we're going to, you know, lead this charge, you know, really then having those conversations, meaningful conversations with how, you know, others can be a part of this. Mm -hmm. You know, many people might not want to do the leadership level, but. You know, here's some other ways that you can contribute to, you know, what we're doing. Because mm -hmm. I think for black people, we like to hear the meat of something, you know. Like, yeah, it's it's kind of scary being on the, on the front yeah, end, right? Yeah, <laughs> you know, it can't just be, well, give me this. Well, why? Right. <laughs> you know, right. what's the why? So, you know, that is kind of my um, way of getting the word out is really being able to have that meaningful conversation with people so they can see, you know, this is what we're trying to do. This is the, the roadmap. Is the conversation different in, since you're a fundraiser, Vivian? Is the conversation... Partly fundraiser. Part, part, part <laughs> fundraiser, okay. <laughs> but is the conversation different with, um, with people from the African-American community than it would be for someone from a different community in terms of asking them for their dollars? It shouldn't be. It shouldn't, because it's all about building those relationships, regardless of what community they're from. It's about building those relationships and building that trust. So it shouldn't be. But going back to what Brittany was saying, people want to know, when am I getting from this? <laughs> 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 so sometimes um, people will want to know, what is the outcome? Why? Mm -hmm. wow. What am mm -hmm. I going to get from it? 
But it all goes back to those relationships and walking in the door. If someone you don't know and you see on the street, you're not going to go up to them and say, can, can I have $500? Right, right, <laughs> you're not right. going to do that. <laughs> so because they're going to they don't know you. So it's all about building those relationships. And that's regardless if you're African-American, Filipino, Hispanic, white, whatever. I think it's about building that trust. So the conversation should not be different. Mm. So if there is, is there a way to um, determine, I guess I'm trying to figure out if there are so many people in the leadership circle who will de- make the determination about whether it will be education or health or or whatever the, the uh, mission will be for the circle. Suppose you don't like that mission. What happens? <laughs> or how does that balance out, I guess is what I'm asking. Try to balance out um, to look at the majority of where people want to give or let's say if you have some people saying arts and some people saying education or some people saying health whatever that particular focus is maybe we support one organization for health and one organization for education but it's really um, about having the leadership circle really get together and really determine what's the focus this year the focus might change the following year so it doesn't have to stay the same just correct. because you pick health this this year it could be something different correct ah, and it's about yeah. give and take and that collective buy-in and and thinking together and thinking about where the long-term impact will be mm-hmm. so it can change from year to year you're not um, tied into a particular interest area. So as you were cultivating people, what kinds of questions were you asked? How were you? <laughs> where, how is the money invested? What, what are you going to do with the funds? Um, so explain it to them. It's an endowment fund. It's invested at the Hampton Roads Community Foundation. We use spider management, which is through the University of Richmond. Mm-hmm. So people ask about fees. So those are kind of the questions that um, people go through and they ask us, um, you know, why, what, what um, how am I giving back? What is going to be important for my community? Mm-hmm. So. Mm-hmm. Anybody say no? I've had people um, say, yes, yeah, say no. <laughs> um, they might have other commitments um, coming in. And so they say maybe no right now, but. Maybe, maybe in the in future. The future. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yes, I mean, and there you're going to have those. <laughs> there's never a time, though, when you cannot come in and participate. Correct. It's okay. just right now we're looking at founding members. So through November 1st. But, yes, you can come in after November 1st and not be a founding member, but still mm-hmm. participate and still be a part. So if you want to participate and you're, you're, you're listening to us now, how do you how do you become a member? So um, the way you can become a member is you can contact me at the foundation, um, 757-622-7951. Um, and then I'll talk to you more about um, what it means to be a founding member mm-hmm. and um, that commitment. I mean, the commitment is different levels that we discuss, but more about what that journey looks like um, in depth. And then after November 1st, we do have a website, visionariesforchange.org. So you can go on there and get more information as well. Mm-hmm. So do you ever hear people say, I have no idea why you have to do a black giving circle? Why can't it just be a giving circle? Just like people say, why is there black um, history month? (laughs) Why is there black (laughs) philanthropy month? And it's about ensuring empowering people in the black community around philanthropy just like there's hispanics in philanthropy there's it's about empowering it and giving them that voice in philanthropy so yes people are going to say that they're going to ask or and then some people ask questions because it's new but they do want to support it mm-hmm. so um so yes you get questions about that black <laughs> philanthropy month black history month those right. are questions that are going to be asked but it's about supporting causes in the black community um we welcome allies we welcome support but yes so and that's a really important point though because it's not about separation Brittany. yes it's, it's about we we will in, it's encouraging but it is as vivian said giving an, an opportunity for empowerment within the community yes yes so. definitely yes. 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240 are the numbers to call join our conversation what do you think are you an active giver outside of um your immediate family let's say um are there other ways that you give back to the community we'd love to hear how you do that 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240 so how do we teach our kids to become more philanthropic 
What should we do? Do you have children? I do not have children do yet. Yeah, okay. No, not yet. <laughs> nieces and nephews. How about I that? I do have <laughs> nieces and nephews. Um, I think we show them, you know, by our actions. You know, we can say, you know, something, you know, a hundred times, but if they see us doing something, then they're more likely to pick pick that up. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if that means, you know, taking them to you know, the homeless shelter with you or the soup kitchen with you so that they can see, you know, what it means to give back. Or if you see that person on the street who, you know, appears to be homeless, you know, and they see you, oh, you know, here's five dollars or um, let me get you something to eat. You know, they see that. So they say, OK, that's how I should. I, that's how I should live my life. I should replicate what I'm seeing my parents or other people in my family do. Mm-hmm. So I think it's just something that you have to demonstrate through your actions. Mm-hmm. Vivian? Yes, I agree <laughs> with um, what Brittany was saying. I think about when I was growing up, I was in the Girl Scouts and um, we had to do different um, volunteer work and wow. different things to get badges. Wow. Um, <laughs> and so it's about. When you're volunteering, like Brittany says, take them with you. Give them an opportunity to be a part of causes and groups like Girl Scouts or giving back if they go to church, giving back in their church. So it's ways that you can start cultivating those relationships um, and teaching them at a young age about philanthropy, about giving back. Mm -hmm. I think about the kid on the street with the lemonade stand and you're trying Mm -hmm. to teach them how to be an entrepreneur. (laughs) It's like, go out there and sell your lemonade. (laughs) So So go out there and and give back and feed the homeless and, and help someone and be kind or like when you mentioned in the, the speech, um, the 11 year old, and you talked yes. about give someone a smile. Yes. So there's different ways. Yeah. You were there when, <laughs> and you was. heard his speech live. What Was it as electrifying as it sounded on the air? It was really good. It yeah. was awesome. He really demanded the crowd. He really just took ownership of it. So it, it was really good to see <laughs> 11 year old up there yes. um, saying the things he was saying. It was awesome. Oh. So now, Brittany, I know you're a CPA and I know you don't do taxes. I get that. Yes. However, let's talk about the fact that with the t- changes in tax laws and so forth, people may may or may not be able to write off um, charitable giving as easily as they used to. Mm-hmm. Do you think that's a hindrance or deterrence for someone to um, give philanthropically? It could be. It shouldn't be based on your reason behind why you're giving. So, you know, I think you should give from a place of, you know, not a tax write-off. Yes, that's a perk. (laughs) Might not be the biggest perk now, but, you know, you you really Mm -hmm. need to give out of the, the notion of, you know, what this is going to do for someone else or what this is going to do for an organization and let that be your focus. Mm-hmm. Has, has Have the laws impacted giving, Vivian? Do you know, like, kind of overall or, or or is it still too early to tell? Yeah, I'm not sure overall um, it, because if people want to give, they're going to give regardless. So um, I'm not sure overall what that impact is Mm -hmm. but I think that like for me I mean yes a tax write-off is great but if I want to give and support a cause I'm going to do that regardless and you also are a founding member I am (laughs) I am (laughs) and if you go to the website you can find the names of others who are giving also Um, let's talk to Anita in Newport News hi Anita you're on the air hi um I just wanted to make a suggestion. Uh, you know, I know they're talking about uh, the founder's circle, but I think we sometimes forget that philanthropy can be on a smaller scale. If you want to give a dollar, if you have a, a million people giving one dollar and committing to that every month, then you have a million dollars a month. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of people, when you say the $500 level or the $25,000 level, they're like, oh, I don't have that. But... You know, but if you, you know, if you have somebody that says, I can give a dollar, I won't buy coffee today, you know, and I can give a dollar to this foundation and commit to that month after month. And then they teach their children to do the same thing. Uh, Then, you know, we could by far have a greater expanse of what we could do for the community. Okay. Thanks, Anita, for the call. We appreciate that. 
you want to respond? Yes, I agree. <laughs> Thank you, Anita. I agree that, um, yes, you can come in and give a dollar each month. Uh, that's great. And so, um, so I mentioned about after November 1st, if you want to support in any way, it can be a dollar, it can be 50 cents, however you want gotcha. to So give the and November support. 1st deadline is for founding members. Correct. Because the point is you're trying to build a um, large enough pot mm-hmm. to create the endowment so that you can start giving back quick more quickly. Correct. Is that, am I correct yes. in that? So that's the okay. whole reason to set it at a particular So it's not dollar it's amount. not meant to exclude anyone from joining the circle. At, at whatever level they'd like to. Right now, though, you're looking for people who can come in at that founding level um, or, yes, founders levels um, so that that money can grow quickly. Correct. Because it's all about the endowment okay. growing and being able to give out money. As it's growing, we're able to be able to give an impact in the community mm-hmm. through grant making. Mm-hmm. So, But they can still come in as far as supporting the giving circle at any level that is below the $1,000 level. Got you. Got you. Okay. So, and that number, give us your number again where people can reach you. Yes. Yeah, so my number, Vivian Odin at the Hampton Rose Community Foundation is 757 757- 622-7951 and I'm happy to talk to you more about Visionaries for Change. Now is um, the Hampton Rose Community Foundation are the organizations that can be supported through the endowment. Do they have to be Southside or are they wherever? So we're looking at Hampton Roads. So Southside okay. and Peninsula okay. and being able to support um charitable organizations in the black community on either side of the water on either side mm-hmm. okay gotcha and these organizations do they have to be a nonprofit? do you will they have to kind of, i guess they have to prove their worth in order to to receive their money right just I like mean, any other any right. other organization would have right to do i mean that. we still have irs guidelines that we have to follow through <laughs> our giving <laughs> so, so the, it has to be towards a uh, organization that's doing a charitable cause so a nonprofit or organization that is a government organization that might be doing something charitable. So okay. yes, it has to be. All right. So we're down to our last minute, Brittany, give someone who may be on the fence thinking about this, give them some encouragement. So don't be on the fence, get off of the fence. It, it doesn't take a lot to give back and to be a philanthropist. I mean, it can be, the dollar a day, you know, if, if that's what suits financially or if zero suits financially, give back your time, you know, okay. don't be on the fence, you know, just, just do it because the second you do it, you're going to immediately realize that this is what I'm supposed to be doing. There you go. That's Brittany Deutsch and Vivian, you get the last 15 seconds. Well, thank you. So <laughs> <laughs> I just encourage you um, to, want to give back to your community and make a change in the community, I encourage you to come um, join Visionaries for Change or just join and be a part of um, organizations that you care about in your community. All right. Thank you so much. That's Vivian Odin. Thank you, ladies. And we'll be right back. Hi, I'm Claude McKnight of Group Take Six, and you're listening to Another View. Okay, one of these times you guys are going to catch me singing. Anyway, (laughs) taking control of your life and fulfilling your greatest desires. Sound good? Well, a millennial from right here in Hampton Roads has made it her mission to help teens and 20-somethings do just that. The program is called Silent No More, and its founder, Chantel Davis, recently shared with our Lisa Godley how she transitioned from blogger to mentor and life coach. Chantel Davis has first-hand knowledge of what it's like to have a dream and trying to navigate through the obstacles in your way by yourself. I can remember being the first person in my immediate family to go to college and not knowing all the avenues for FAFSA or to get that financial aid in and choosing a school that was actually way above my financial means and having to take that two and a half year break. I just feel like if I had like that proper guidance and someone to help me actually navigate through that area, it would have been 
a lot easier and I might not have to take a two and a half year break. I could have went to a different school. I might have even chosen community college. It was during her educational journey that Chantel had an awakening. She was studying abroad in Israel when she was inspired to start a blog. My blogs would always talk about topics that people wouldn't want to talk about on a normal basis. So I would just write about just random things, hard things, and talk about it from a transparent mode for myself. And then I'd put it out there and say, all right, guys, what do you think about it? I got a lot of feedback from it. Like, oh my gosh, you're just putting yourself out there. I felt like this too. I wrote about topics concerning dealing with grief when someone passes away, just dealing with depression. I just wrote about stuff like that. And then people would just respond. So as people were responding, I was already in a mentoring mode anyway, mentoring teenagers that were younger than me. And I started having conversations with teens. And then I just saw how it can branch out into an actual program. She started Silent No More in 2014, giving young people tools to help them find their voice. And they're guided on their journey by mentors. And yes, life coaches. Why does a young person need a life coach? There are different reasons why one would need a life coach. It could be I'm in a bad situation and I don't feel like I can even pursue a goal because I have a child or I don't feel like I can pursue a goal because I don't have the support system of my family. Whatever it may be, a life coach is there as that extra push and that extra motivation to just say we're here. We're here to help you, here to guide you. I mean, even thinking about myself as a young person, we think that we know, but we don't know. And when you get to that place of being a junior and a senior and you realize, okay, you know, high school's about to be over and I don't really have all the clues of what to do in this adult life, it can be scary, it can be intimidating, especially when you're in circumstances or situations where the obstacle is greater. Just ask 24-year-old Andres McDowell and 19-year-old Tia Ray. Both were quick to share how the program has made a difference in their lives. I was one of those guys that wasn't really sure about where they was going in life, you know. And uh, Silent No More helped me out a lot. I had talents here and there, but I wasn't sure. And I started doing graphics, and they helped me to push myself out there and, and motivate me to like put my artwork out there. It really helped me out a lot. They gave me guidance and direction when I didn't have a direction at all. When I graduated high school, education wasn't really that important to me until I realized the goal that I was trying to achieve. So when I found out about Silent No More, it helped me find a passion and something that I wanted to do, which is nursing. In the program, we do peer building activities and we do self-esteem activities. And so we kind of build that net and that motivation. Then we dive in and help research. Chantel says currently Silent No More is based in communities. And while they have done work in schools on a small scale, they're hoping to expand so that many more young people can get access to the tools they need to reach their goals and be exposed to messaging like this. Though we go through some hardships in life, it's about how we look at them. And so let's talk about what's going on, but then let's see how we can look at that differently. For Another View, I'm Lisa Godley. And Silent No More will host its inaugural walkathon and cookout to benefit at-risk at teens this Saturday, August 31st at 10 o'clock at Lafayette Park, 3500 Granby Street in Norfolk. For more information, visit ChantelAthena.com and click on the walkathon tab. And by the way, Chantel is a former intern with Another View, and we are so very proud of her accomplishments. Thank you so much for spending an hour of your life with here with us here at another view if you'd like to listen to other programs we've produced please visit our website anotherviewradio.org and download the podcast of your choosing and while you're there please sign up for our ev newsletter it's a once a week reminder of upcoming information up upcoming shows and we're live on facebook so like us and i'm on twitter at barbara ham lee next time on another view dr eric claville with his claville report you may recall he predicted the election of president trump right here on this program and next week he will have his prediction for the 2020 election our theme music was composed and performed by jay sennett lisa godley is our show producer and todd washburn is our audio engineer i'm barbara ham lee have a fantastic holiday weekend and thank you so very very much for listening to another view <laughs> <laughs>